We're going to continue in our series on First Peter of the Weeble Factor. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We have nine people here today, three men and six women, and we really sh are lopsided. We really should have more men here than women today because this is a message for us. It's a message we get to rejoice in because it's the hot topic. It's the thing that's always talked about in marriage relationships. You know, it's the wives, be in submission to your husbands. It's wives, submit. Submit, get out the old ball and chain. You know how that goes. The man is the king of his castle, right? Now, nah, guess what? <laughs> Those are all biblically incorrect. Those are worldly interpretations of what the New Testament means by submission. And in reality, there are more conditions placed on the husband's submission to the wife than there are the wife's submission to the husband. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at what does it really mean to be submissive? Because we talked last week about submissiveness and being in submission to governmental leaders and being in submission to God. Well now, this concept of submission comes into the home. And the fact that submission must characterize our lives in our homes if we are going to be able to be the weebles who wobble and don't fall down when the trials of life come our way. Submission is to be a life event not a specific event. It's supposed to encompass our whole life. And so Peter starts with saying, okay, be in submission to the governmental leaders, be in submission to your masters, be in submission um, to Christ. And now he says, okay, let's take that one step further. We're going to go to where you have the hardest time with this concept. We're going to bring it into the family. But before we really get into the meat of the text, we need to first make an observation that Peter spends more time per word in this passage speaking to wives than he does speaking to husbands. Of course, the guys who want to take this in their own way really want to jump on that. But the reality is you have to remember that Peter is speaking to Roman colonies to believers in Roman colonies. Greek, um, the Gre Greco-Roman Empire, or really more prior to that, is, is from Alexander and on in the Greek Empire. Women were given more and more rights. Women were given more and more opportunities to be business women, to, to be women of means in their own right. But when Rome came and conquered again, women began to take on the, the Roman role, and that Roman role was, at best, they were a little bit lower than the men. Uh, they really couldn't own property, except where they were allowed to own the property that they owned under Grecian rule, and even some of that was subject. You had to have really a male name attached to it somehow, um, but women were second-class citizens, uh, and worse, they were seen as possessions. So they couldn't own p property, they couldn't be involved in politics in an official way. Though I will tell you, if you study Roman history, you will find that women were quite influential in politics. They weren't the senators, <laughs> but they surely influenced the senators. Okay? So you have this whole philosophy of women being subservient to men, actually being servants to men by law. What happens when the gospel comes is women are elevated to a new status, being co-equal with men, being joint heirs with Jesus Christ, with men who were Christians as well. And the women and the men really didn't know how to deal with this because this was new. Culturally, it was a new thing. There was a liberation that was going on in the name of Jesus Christ. Women were being liberated. They were becoming joint heirs. They were becoming influential in the church. They were becoming important politically within the church as well. 
you know, not as much as maybe some would want, but it was a dramatic reversal of roles. And so he needed to spend a little bit more time helping women to understand how they needed to deal with that new freedom so that they didn't go from one, from one extreme to another, but fell right in the middle where Christ wants them to be. So he spends more time dealing with the, the issue with women, with wives, than he gives time to how he's, the words that he uses for men. So if you look at the passage, a lot more words directed at the wives than there are directed at the husbands. But again, if you look at the passage, you'll see that the specific instructions are more specific in the case of the men than the women. The second thing is, and it's our first point, is what does the Bible mean? What does Peter mean when he talks about submission? So we want to look at submission defined. Uh, prior to the New Testament, the Greek general usage of submission was in a reference to an army and an order of rank order. So it was it, um, being under someone, meaning that the military fashion under the command of a leader. That's the word. The Greek word was used predominantly for that. It also had a secondary meaning um, of a voluntary attitude in giving in or cooperating, uh, assuming responsibility, and carrying another's burden. But that was really secondary. It was really, it was really a ranking order. And so that's where a lot of people come in with, well, you know, the man's the general and the woman's the private. You know, nah, it's not supposed to be ranking under like that. There is a sense of ranking that the New Testament tells us about men and women. And that New Testament ranking basically is the buck stops with the man in any family relationship. If something's going wrong in the family, God first looks at the husband. And the husband is held responsible for what's going wrong in the family. Uh, that's basically the ranking structure in the New Testament with regard to submission. Is that, you know, <laughs> it's the husband that's responsible of, before God for what's going on in his family. Um, they're partners, they're joint heirs, but when something's going wrong, God's going to look at the husband and say, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing here? It shouldn't be like this. And so he holds responsibility. He's also the protector of the family. He's held in responsibility of protecting the family. But when you talk about New Testament concept of submission, what Peter is talking about, it's, it doesn't immediately carry the idea of obedience. Um, most people think that being in submission means you obey. That's not what the New Testament talks about. The New Testament is, is focused on the, the, the demand of the, in general, it's the demands of readiness to renounce one's own will for the sake of another. So to be in submission is I am ready at any moment to renounce my will for the sake of another. You go, okay, but you know, that's kind of that's hard to do. And it, yeah, it is. It's impossible to do without agape love, without unconditional love, the love that Christ showed. Because Christ was obedient to God. He was submissive to God, even though they are co-equal, even though they are the triune God. He willingly gave up his rights and privileges as God to come to earth to be the servant leader for us, to show us how we could come into the family of God. So he willingly gave up his rights for us. That's the example that submission means. It's not obedience. It's not ball and chain. But it's because I love, I will willingly give up my right to express myself out of love for the other. Understand now that this passage ends up talking about mutual submission. It's not just the wife's responsibility, it's the husband's responsibility as well. 
Because to truly be submissive in that way, if it's all one-sided, it's not going to last very long. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that I'm the doormat, that I do everything that the other one wants. It's now I submit. And when it comes to well, um, the husband, he needs to submit as well. So it's a mutual thing. So submission is a willingness to give up my rights uh, for the other. And so we're going to read our text now so that we have the basis from which to understand how we implement that in our lives. And this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give away to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The first thing I want to say, because we're not really going to deal with it, is Peter is not saying anything negative about jewelry and makeup and fine clothes. He's just saying that shouldn't be where your focus is. You know, um, so some people want to take that passage and say, oh, well, you can't wear makeup and you can't wear jewelry and you can't. And no, that's not what Peter's saying at all. Peter's saying that shouldn't be the focus of how you express your beauty. The focus of how you express your beauty should come from within and not from without. But there's nothing wrong with expressing beauty from without, just not as a primary way. So how do we practice submission? Peter's already told us. 1 Peter 1.15, the first step in practicing submission. But just as you are called to be holy, so be holy in all that you do. It's holy living. So it's submission to God's rule, to God's standard, not to man's standard. So again, it's pointing back to that love relationship between the Father and the Son, where the father was submissive, where the son was submissive to the father, and he came to be a servant to die on the cross for our sins. So it always points back to God. We need to live our lives in a holy way. We need to be pure in how we live our lives as husbands and wives. And we need to live our lives in reverence of both reverence of God because he is holy, but reverence also connotes the sense of respect. So we need to respect God, and we need to respect our spouses. So the first step is to be holy, to be pure, and to have respect one for another. The second that Peter is talking about for wives is the focus on spiritual beauty, the inward beauty. He wants us to live lives that reflect Jesus Christ. And especially, he's pointing that to the wife. Again, part of it's cultural, um, because <coughs> he wants the wife to know that, that she has a role of influence. And as joint heirs with her husband, if her husband's a believer, um, she has the responsibility of, of expressing herself in a godly way. And if she does, things can happen. There can be a godly influence within the home. He's addressing it specifically because in most instances, at the time of Peter, as the church moved, women were more responsive to the gospel than men. And so women got saved, but they were married to unbelievers. And they had questions, and how do I live my new Christian life 
with an unbelieving husband. How do I do that? Christ has changed my life, but now how do I live? And he talks about the spiritual beauty that's there. And Dr. Cedar, in his commentary, relays a story of a woman who was married to a non-believer, and they lived significantly immoral lives. She came to salvation, and she didn't know how to tell her husband or what to tell her husband, so she went to Dr. Cedar, her pastor, to get some counsel. And he said, this is what I counsel you. And he read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he said, what you need to do is when the day is appropriate, you need to tell him about the fact that you accepted Christ, and you need to tell him what Christ has done for you and what Christ means to you. And then you need to tell him that you would one day like him to receive Christ as well. And then never mention your relationship with Christ, never mention the gospel again unless he asks or unless you are prompted by the Holy Spirit. But live your life for Christ before him and let that witness have an effect in his life. Months later, Dr. Cedar had the privilege of leading her husband to the Lord. And he asked him, what was the most influential factor in your coming to the Lord? And without a hesitation, he said, my wife. A couple of weeks ago, she had told me about her accepting Christ, what Christ meant to her, and then she didn't say anything else. But whenever I asked her a question, she had an answer for me. Whenever I asked her what it meant for her, she would share with me. And so I gained that information from my wife. And you know, I noticed from the time she said she accepted Christ until the time that I've come to Christ that her life was different. And I knew that the changes that were happening in her life were the very things that I needed to happen in my life. And I believe those changes are because of Jesus Christ. And I want to live for him. You know, that's what Peter's talking about. Don't badger, don't preach, don't harangue, but just live your life. And that's for husbands and wives. But specifically, he's addressing one of the issues that was in the church. So many women that were coming to Christ and their husbands were unsaved. And how do you live for Christ when your husband's unsaved? Submission is the key. But that is predicated upon agape love. Agape love means there aren't any conditions on it. You just love. Because love is a choice. True love, agape love, is a choice. It's not a feeling. Because you can love somebody with unconditional love and not feel love for them at any given moment in any given day. <laughs> we all know that who have been in relationships. There are some times where you just don't feel love for that mate. But you love them. And you love them through that feeling. Because that, those emotions are going to go up and down throughout your life. We all know that. Because our emotions most often are predicated by the circumstances around us. What we feel any given day usually is strongly influenced by the circumstances that we're involved in. And that's why so many people today that don't understand that love is a decision, love is a choice, they go on that up and down roller coaster of how they feel. And I don't feel in love with you today, so I'm going to go with this one who I feel love for. You know, and bounce all around. You know, so agape love, agape love, love is a choice. Submission is a choice. You can't make somebody submit because you can't deal with the inside. They may do what you ask them to do on the outside, but they're not submitting if their heart's not in it. 
So submission, biblical submission, is also a choice. But it's a choice that can't truly be made unless you have unconditional love. And you can't truly have unconditional love unless you're a believer. So you have to have love being the root of Christian submission. A love for God, a love of God. I also have to have a love for myself as a child of God. Because if I can't truly love myself, I can't truly love somebody else. I have to love myself as God loves me. And in so doing, then I'm able to love others. Christian submission is voluntary. It's a choice. To submit is not to be inferior. To the contrary, Jesus was co-equal with God, and he submitted even to the point of death on the cross. Submission is doing what's right in God's eyes, not what's right in somebody else's eyes. Because we don't submit and violate God's rules. We submit in conjunction with God's rules. So we don't say yes to things that God would say we shouldn't do. So we're submitting to God first, and we're submitting to our spouse secondarily. We're not to be afraid about submission. Can you imagine women growing, growing up in a culture that says you're a possession, and then Christ gives you freedom, and now Peter says submit? That's going to put me right back into that position of being a slave. It's going to put me back into that position of being a position, a possession. He says, no, because that's the world's idea of submission. It's not the God's idea of submission. So if you're doing it the way God wants it done, you don't have to be afraid. Then he talks about mutual submission. Wives submit to your husbands. Husbands submit to your wives. And both of you got to submit to God. Submit to one another. And Christians are supposed to submit to Christians. And then submission, now he's going to talk to the husband. How does the husband have to submit to the wife? First, he says, you need to love her. Unconditionally, with agape love. Then you need to understand her. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh, that's where most of us fall down, huh? To submit to our wives and have mutual submission, she's not going to be able to submit to us unless we understand her. And we have to understand her. We have to understand what she likes and what she doesn't like. We have to understand her in the sense that the Greek word is talking about. It's, it's to know, and it's to know profoundly. We need to know our spouses in a profound way. We need to know our wives inside. We need to know what makes them tick. We need to know what makes them happy. We need to know their needs, their wants, and their desires. To know another requires time, honesty, mutual openness, patience, sensitivity, and above all, love. And then we have to honor them and respect them. So he wraps up a whole lot of what men are supposed to do with regard to being in submission to their wives need to know them and know them intimately, need to know wants, desires, and needs, and need, we need to respect and honor them at all times, in all occasions. You've seen husbands dishonor their wives in public, haven't you? And how does that make you feel? You know, smack the guy, <laughs> you know? You don't treat a woman like that. You don't treat your wife like that. And you've seen women dishonor and disrespect their husbands. You know, you go, what's wrong with you people? How do you expect to stay together in a loving relationship if you treat each other like that in public? Because if you do it in public, you know it's worse in private. You know, how does a relationship endure? How does a relationship grow in a healthy way when you disrespect and when you don't honor? So he's saying, husbands, above all else, honor and respect. Poem by an unknown author. Woman was created from the rib of man. She was not made from his head to top him nor out of his foot to be under him, but out of his side to be equal to him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. You know, the mutual relationship. We're always to remember that we're joint heirs. We're equal before God. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord when we're believers together. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's Ephesians 4.32. Submission, remember, is a willingness to renounce one's own will 
for the sake of others, to give precedence to them and their needs, and this out of a profound type of love, unconditional love, agape love. And then submission has rewards. Remember, there is the ranking situation where God says, man, you're responsible for your family. And so he points the rewards to submission to the man, but they equally apply to the wife. Obedience to God's command, that's the first reward. When you submit to one another, you're obeying God's command. And God rewards obedience always, always, always. He rewards obedience. Second, mutual submission requires that there be love and understanding. And when you love and understand your spouse, there are rewards that go with that. <laughs> and then thirdly, and most importantly, if you treat your wife the way you're supposed to, your prayers will not be hindered. When men don't treat their wives properly, their shield is down and the enemy can attack. And God's not going to answer their prayers as quickly as he would if they were walking the way they should walk. So when a husband mistreats his wife, his prayers are going to be hindered. When a wife mistreats her husband, her prayers are going to be hindered as well. So there are benefits to submission that go far beyond that relationship. Submissions must characterize our lives if we are to be the weebles who wobble but don't fall down when the trials of life come our way. Submission to worldly affairs, which we discussed last week. Submission in the home and submission to Christ. As we contemplate how God wants us to fine tune this area of our lives, we have a perfect opportunity to be in submission to him. Because on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he took the cup and he said, take, eat and drink and do this whenever you come together in remembrance of me. In that loving remembrance of him and what he's done for us, we come to the table to share the communal meal that he set forth for us. And so as we come to the table, we want to make sure that we come with our hearts purified and cleansed so we take time to confess our sins to him and ask his forgiveness and get ourselves right with him before we come to the table. So let's take a moment of silence to just come before him and confess our sins to him and come to the table. Father, thank you for your love. A love that abounds. Each of us here have done things we shouldn't have done. And we've left undone things that we should have done. We call that sin. You call that sin. And it's because of sin that Jesus came to die on the cross. For our forgiveness of sin. And for us to have eternal life with you. So as we come, we ask that you would forgive us for those things that we've done that we shouldn't have done. And we ask your forgiveness for those things that we didn't do that we should have done. And we ask that you forgive us. And as your word says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we ask for your cleansing as well as we come to your table, may we strengthen our relationship with you as we submit to your love. And in so doing for those of us that are husbands and wives, that we would strengthen our relationship with our spouses by mutually submitting to each other, by mutually submitting to you for your glory and for your honor. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's come to the table.